Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SpudSmart Innovation Series webinar. My name is Ashley Robinson, and I'm the editor of SpudSmart. Today, I'll be serving as your host for this webinar. The theme for today's webinar is, is fighting back against late phthalate. This webinar is brought to you by the Canadian Potato Council. The Canadian Potato Council received funding for today's webinar through the Canadian Horticultural Council as part of the Canadian Agricultural Partnership commonly known as CAP. Our presenter for this webinar is Rick Peters, who is a research scientist with AAFC Charlottetown. In today's webinar, you'll learn about late blight prevention and management strategies, how researchers are forecasting late blight risk, how researchers are identifying late blight strains, and how late blight can spread among plants. During the presentation, you'll likely have some questions for our speaker please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar and we'll address them during the question and answer session following the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available at spudsmart.com following this live event. Rick is the principal investigator of various studies on the biology and management of diseases of potato, carrots, and other vegetable crops. He is an active member of the Canadian Phytopathological Society, where he serves as the Atlantic Regional Representative. He also serves as an adjunct professor at the University of Prince Edward Island and Dalhousie University. Take it away, please, Rick. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and hi, everyone. Um, again, I appreciate the invitation to um, spend some time with you today. And my hope here today is to just give you an overview of a project that we've been working on for a few years now. And uh, if I think about late blight in general, it's been pretty much uh, getting close to 20 years that I've been working on this disease. Um, but the most recent work is done through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program with the Canadian Horticultural Council and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And um, we have a program that's looking uh, around late blight um, from a few different angles, uh, not only trying to identify the strains that we are getting or commonly seeing in Canada in recent years, and then also some of the characteristics of those strains and uh, why that's important and what kinds of management tools we can use to, uh, to fight back against late blight, as the title says. So just an overview of the project itself. So it's, uh, as I mentioned, a cluster project with the, the Horticultural Council. Um, entitled Tracking Pathogen Strains and Their Characteristics. Um, there's myself in Charlottetown and Rishi in uh, Agassiz, BC uh, as the AAFC components. And then we have Khalil El Magrabi uh, in New Brunswick, Fuad Daif in Manitoba, as well as Vikram Bisht. And then of course we have many collaborators, uh, growers and, and people in government or academia and industry. Um, it's really a strong network across the country that helps us uh, in gathering samples, identifying the disease uh, when it happens, and then getting those samples to us um, either in BC or Charlottetown to then process those further. Um, and there's two main activities. So the first is tracking the strains uh, that we do find in, in a given year. And then secondly, trying to figure out some of the characteristics of those strains, uh, what types of hosts they prefer or cultivars, um, some of the environmental triggers for the different strains, uh, their sensitivity to different fungicides, and then overall looking at sort of management of these strains and how that changes with the strains that are in a given area. So just a bit of a, a start up uh, or background looking at the pathogen that causes late blight, it's called Phytophthora infestans. We tend to think of it more like a fungus and we sort of treat it that way, but it's really um, more closely related to algae. It's called an oomycete. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we kind of think of it like a fungus, so um, we'll, we'll sort of manage it in that way. Um, you'll see some symptoms here on the tubers and also on the leaves. Uh, on the lower right of the screen, you'll see those lemon-shaped spores. Um, those are the spores that can spread very readily in rain and wind events from one plant to another or from one field to an adjacent field. And in fact, we've tracked some of these um, traveling in storm systems up the eastern seaboard for many hundreds of kilometers. So under the right conditions, they can move a long way to, to spread disease. The spore that's on the lower left uh, 
is a little different. It's called an ooze spore. It's kind of like an egg. Um, it's very circular, as you can see there. It's got a thick wall, and that's the one that only forms when you have an A1 and an A2 strain of the pathogen get together. And that's uh, kind of a result of the sexual recombination. And that's important because a couple of reasons, those spores tend to be able to survive longer periods in the soil in some parts of the world. Uh, and as well, it's a way to generate new strains much more quickly. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go through the talk. So here are some typical symptoms of late blight on potato. Um, typically you get these leaf lesions that are kind of water soaked or oily looking. And if you flip over the leaf under conditions that are, you know, a little bit cooler, more humid, sometimes those early morning dews, you'll see the white fuzz uh, on the undersurface there uh, in the picture on the upper right. And that's where all those spores are, are being generated. Of course, you can get lesions on the stems too. And when those uh, spores wash down, from the leaves down into the soil and percolate through the soil via cracks and so on, they can infect the tubers. And typically you'll get this kind of a rusty red granular look to the tuber when it's infected. Now commonly you'll also get other organisms coming into play like bacteria, which can quickly rot these down. But if it's late blade only, it's actually pretty dry rot and uh, has that granular look to it like you see there. Um, of course, tomato is another crop that can be affected, same as potato, since they're very related plants. Um, and the symptoms look very similar on the leaves, the same type of lesions. And again, you can get the stem lesions, as you see here. The tomato fruit tends to also get this kind of reddish, granular, dry, sunken lesion um, when it's infected. So, um, you know, you certainly get some similar looking symptoms on those both crops. So in terms of our first activity, I mentioned tracking the strains of the pathogen in Canada. Um, so we do have a really good network of collaborators across the country that send samples of infected tissues, could be leaves, stems, or tubers. And um, either they're sent to um, Agassiz, where Rishi is, or to myself in Charlottetown. And um, we then isolate the pathogen from these tissues into pure culture and so that we can then work with it to do some of the characterization and strain work. So in Charlottetown, we look a lot at the type of mating type. Remember I mentioned the A1 and A2 strains that, that are um, you know, components for this pathogen for sexual recombination, we check that. We're also looking at Ritamil or metal axle sensitivity and also some other fungicide sensitivities, which I'll mention later. And then we look at something called the allozyme genotype. It's one of the tools that we sort of use to get an idea of the type of strain, strain we're dealing with. And then the final determination is a DNA fingerprinting step. And that's being done by Rishi and Agassiz. And we also have Larry Kochuk in Lethbridge, who um, has worked for many years on late blight and uh, is an expert in this uh, pathogen as well. And uh, he's doing some contract work for us in this project to help with some of that DNA fingerprinting work. So we have a really good team to, um, to sort of get a handle on what's happening uh, with the strains in each year. So just a bit of background, how things have played out. Um, back in the mid nineties, we used to have a strain called US1, which was an A1 mating type and quite sensitive to Ritamil. But in those mid nineties years, we had a displacement event where a new strain called US8, which was an A2 and quite resistant to Ritamil, um, started taking over much of the production areas. And I should mention that US1 strain had been around for you know, over 100 years, uh, ever since potatoes were really grown in, in this country. Um, and it's really only you know the mid 90s where we saw some of these new things start to take place. Um, we also had some other variants in some other parts uh, of the country. So in BC, for example, we had a strain called US11, which was an A1, but also quite resistant to Ritamil. So, so things were changing quite dramatically uh, in the mid 90s. Um, we had another event in 2009 to 2011 approximately, where that US8, which had become dominant, was then again displaced by another strain, US23, which was an A1, largely sensitive to Ritamil, although sometimes we were finding a little bit of insensitivity creeping in. But then we also had a lot of other variation happening. So strains like US22 on tomatoes in Ontario, 24 showed up in various provinces, 
Uh, and then in the West Coast, we often had eight and 11 still appearing, um, you know, over the years. So there started to be a lot more diversity in the strains that we were finding. Fast forward a little bit to just a few years ago, um, we started to see US 23 really starting to dominate the landscape uh, in both potatoes and tomatoes across the country, except for BC where we were still finding US 8 and sometimes other strains too. Fast forward again to 2017 and onward, because we're still uh, sort of determining some of the strain work from uh, 2019 and the most recent year, 2020. Um, but for the most part, US 23 has now become our dominant genotype across the country, except for BC, where we still find quite a diversity in strains. US 8, 11, and 23 are, are, are all fairly common on both potatoes and tomatoes. So uh, a lot of sort of homogenous situation in most of the country with 23 dominating, but a lot more diversity looks like uh, in BC right now. So how do these things get around? Well, there's a few ways. I mentioned that oospore, that circular spore, um, which is a result of a mating between an A1 and A2. That's something that um, can happen, um, but for the most part so far in Canada, we don't think it's happening very much. Uh, I'll talk about that uh, in just a minute on the next slide. Movement on potato seed is another way that strains can get around. Of course, we have seed moving uh, from one region to another in any given year and a late blight can piggyback on that and um, germinate to produce an infected plant. So that's another way that strains can move. And a, a significant new avenue in the last decade or so has been movement of late blight on tomato transplants. Uh, those also move quite uh, long distances in the continent. And, um, you know, we've certainly had examples of finding infected plants in, in various nurseries and box stores, for example, and home gardeners have become a really significant source of disease now with this new US 23 strain. And I'll mention uh, a little bit more about that later as well. Um, so back to that circular ooze spore, um, we've had some circumstantial evidence based on some strange, or I guess you could call recombinant genotypes. They're just sort of ones that we don't find very often, but they do occur in Ontario and BC. And we usually find these when an A1 strain and an A2 strain are in the same production area, usually only for a short period of time. Um, but as you remember in BC, we often have US 11, which is an A1, and US 8, which is an A2 together. And it's during those times when we'd find some of these other recombinant um, strains. Now, so far, they haven't been significant players in the disease that we know about. Uh, they tend to appear and disappear quite quickly. But we're keeping an eye on that because it's quite possible that um, you know you will generate a new strain this way that is more aggressive and causes more disease and is perhaps more resistant to some of the fungicides, et cetera. Um, so that's something we're definitely keeping an eye on. So as far as we know, this sort of oospores uh, and generation of oospores isn't a major role in disease um, in Canada, but the vigilance is gonna be really important because we don't want to see the situation uh, which is occurring in some countries where oospores actually can overwinter and cause disease quite early in the season since they are quite a resistant spore. So, um, uh, so far it's not a big player it looks like, but it's starting to become a situation that we're a little bit concerned about and we're going to keep an eye on to see how that plays out in time. Um, you know, not too different from the current situation with uh, COVID, Everyone's looking at the different strains that are starting to appear. Each of those strains has different characteristics and it's important to know what those are so we can deal with them more effectively. So just some summary comments then on that first activity on tracking strains. US 23 so far is, is currently the predominant genotype on both tomato and potato, but we do still find other genotypes regionally. And um, I mentioned US 23 is an A1 type, uh, usually sensitive to windmill, but we do find that there's some insensitivity sometimes late in the season, and um, that can impact the uh, efficacy of that product, certainly as the time goes on. Um, and because the new populations do fluctuate every year, we do certainly need to continue this monitoring so that we can better understand the, the dynamics of the disease uh, as time goes on. I should mention, you know, that the last few years, 
late blight hasn't been as common in Canada as it typically is, especially in the East Coast where I am. Um, you know, in the 20 years that I've been working uh, in PEI on this disease, it was rarely a year where I wouldn't see late blight. But the last two or three years have been very warm and dry, and late blight hasn't been a factor um, in our production area. Now, of course, that can change this year quite quickly, but, you know, climate change is certainly starting to impact uh, what diseases we see and, and where they're distributed. And um, certainly we might see how uh, that affects late blight moving forward as well. Second activity in the project is around trying to characterize some of these strains. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, what hosts they prefer, some of their environmental triggers and uh, response to fungicides and so on. Um, so we do a lot of work on inoculating not only tubers, but also plants in the greenhouses. Um, here's a little study we looked at uh, inoculating some potato tubers of different cultivars or varieties with different strains of the pathogen, in this case, as a US8, a 23, and a 24. And what we tended to find is that the newer strains, like 23 and 24, were just as aggressive or even more aggressive uh, on potato tubers than the US8 strain, which was dominant for so many years in the late 90s uh, and early 2000s. Um, and in many ways, I call US23 a kind of a sneaky strain because uh, it tends not to cause as aggressive a disease in the foliage as USA did in the past, but is super aggressive on tubers. So you can go into a field and you know you think you're managing the disease pretty well, and um, you have a low simmering level there that's still putting spores into the soil to infect the tubers, and then there's a high level of tuber rot, tuber rot going into storage. So it's a concern, certainly from that perspective. Looking at the environmental aspects, we do a, a number of experiments where we um, inoculate tuber slices like you see here with the pathogen and the different strains and put them at different temperatures just to see how well the pathogen will grow and produce spores at different environmental conditions. And what we're tending to find is that compared to USA, US23 can actually um, sporulate and produce a lot more spores more quickly. Uh, after inoculation. So typically when a spore lands on a leaf, it can take five or six days before you start to see inf uh, you know, the symptoms of infection, the disease development. But it looks like in 23, uh, that can actually um, start to happen a little more quickly. And in terms of the um, temperature range, it does look like US23 can produce spores and infect at a slightly larger range than USA did. Uh, so typically around 15 to 20 degrees is the optimal temperature for infection and disease development for any of the strains. Um, but even at some cooler and warmer temperatures, US23 seem to perform a little better. So some of these, uh, you know, these are preliminary results right now. We're still doing a lot of work on, on this aspect with um, a temperature gradient tool that Rishi has in, in Agassiz that is going to really hone and define some of the key temperature points for the 23 strain but it's looking like this could be one of the reasons that it's become dominant in the country. Is it just a little better fitness uh, under different conditions than USA did? Uh, we also look at different hosts and we inoculate various types of plants and also different varieties uh, in the greenhouse setting with the different strains that we typically find in Canada. And we've set up sort of this tented situation in the greenhouse and we have misters to create really, you know, excellent conditions for infection and disease development. And we look at a lot of different, uh, as I mentioned, plant species and, and different varieties to see how they respond to the different strains of the pathogen. And typically um, we don't see a lot of disease on petunias or peppers so far. Doesn't look like those crops are major players in, in the disease um, sort of situation. Uh, in Canada, but certainly potatoes and tomatoes are, are highly affected, but differentially so by the different strains. So you can see that US8, which we used to deal with in the brown color here, is much more aggressive on potatoes than it is on tomatoes. But the flip is true of 23, which is much more aggressive on tomatoes versus potatoes. Now that's not to say that it doesn't cause disease in potatoes, it certainly does. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a bit sneaky because it's really aggressive on tubers. So, um, but this is just highlighting that, 
uh, you know, there are differences in how the strains respond to different hosts. Uh, 24, as you can see here, the green line is kind of intermediate between the two strains. Uh, we do a lot of work on tomatoes, looking at how the different varieties respond that a lot of home gardeners would typically grow. And for the most part, a lot of them are very susceptible to infection with US-23. But there is some material that's quite resistant. And you can see some of the, um, of the varieties here, particularly Mountain Magic, Mountain Merit, and so forth, uh, which have two known genes for late blight resistance. And some of these are from the uh, North Carolina State Breeding Program. They're very uh, resistant to disease development. Um, and we're really encouraging home gardeners to start to grow some of these resistant varieties um, so that they, A, um, get a good crop of tomatoes to harvest at the end of the season, but B, also they're not a source of spores to, surmount, uh, to surrounding uh, production areas of either potatoes or tomatoes. So just some summary comments then on some of these strain characteristics. Um, the strains definitely vary in their preference for different hosts and how aggressive they are in those hosts. Eight and 24 are more aggressive on potato foliage than 23, but US 23 was the most aggressive on the tomato foliage, uh, but still causes significant disease in potato foliage as well. And, um, you know, we do see some sporulating lesions on pepper and petunia, but for the most part, that disease is very low. So they're not likely major players in the disease epidemics in Canada. All the genotypes are pretty aggressive on tubers, uh, particularly the US-23, which is now dominant in the country, except for BC. Uh, tomato varieties with multiple genes for blight resistance are really effective at suppressing disease development, particularly that caused by US-23, which as I mentioned, is really aggressive on tomato. Um, and you know, this whole idea of the epidemiology of the disease and how it's managed is really altered now with the new strains that we have. And because of that, <clears throat> we've been really targeting um, how late blight is managed in tomatoes. Um, there's a lot of people that grow tomatoes in their home gardens. And, you know, in the past when US8 was the, uh, the dominant strain, uh, we didn't really worry too much about the tomato angle because it didn't really affect tomatoes uh, that readily. Completely different scene with 23 now, where the tomatoes are very much affected. And, um, you know, home gardeners uh, that grow tomatoes can be a source of disease for surrounding commercial crops. And so we've been doing a lot of surveillance, looking for disease in transplants and nurseries and so on, getting the message out to home uh, owners to destroy any disease plants that they see basically by bagging them and making sure they're not put in compost piles or anything like that. And, um, you know, growing resistant varieties, uh, really trying to increase the awareness of the issue in the general public. So to that extent, we've done a lot of industry meetings with garden center staff and clubs. We've even distributed some of this late blight resistant tomato seed for free just to, to get the ball rolling, so to speak, uh, on this angle. Done a lot of media work and, and a lot of the uh, nurseries now in, in the different provinces um, are starting to you know, offer more of this late blight resistant material uh, to the public and giving some information so that the public's aware of the issue. Now, I should mention here that, um, you know, in terms of fungicides for late blight, which is still a very significant tool uh, used in commercial crops, um, so far we haven't really found any resistance other than sometimes to Ritamil, as I mentioned, we haven't really found any resistance to any other late play fungicides. And that's that's been a really good news story so far of this project. Uh, something we're still looking at, but uh, so far the new strains uh, have been quite susceptible to the, you know, the fungicides that are in the toolbox. So they're, they're still very effective. And in, in addition, some of the other classical control measures like, um, you know, disposing culls, volunteer potatoes and, and using clean seed, that kind of thing. All of those traditional measures still are very effective, even with the new strains. Um, so it's important to mention that. Uh, I think that is all I have for you today. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention. And again, thank the funding partners, the uh, Canadian Agriculture Partnership Program with the Hort Council in Canada, as well as Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. A lot of technical support people that help generate the information and of course, all of our network of growers and provincial academic specialists and the industry reps that really uh, are critical 
to um, getting the samples and to getting the information nationally that we need to to make this project go forward. So uh, I think that's it, Ashley. Thanks everyone for your attention and I look forward to trying to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Rick. Great presentation. I'd now like to do a short question and answer session. And if you have any questions for our presenter that you haven't typed in yet to the chat box, please type it in now. And I'll start with our first one. It comes from Ryan Barrett. And his question is, at what temperature are O-spores killed slash inactivated? Thanks for the question, Ashley. And thank you, Ryan, for that question. A very good question. Not one that we have a lot of information about yet. So when you think about survival of O-spores, if you think about where the pathogen originates, which is in South America, Mexico, and central part of uh, of, um, of Mexico and it's into South America, uh, there's a lot of different strains there, hundreds really, and a lot of different A1 and A2 strains which get together to produce ooze spores which survive under those conditions. In more northerly places, we have seen survival of ooze spores in places like the Netherlands and perhaps some surrounding parts of Europe. And there's been evidence of early season disease caused by uh, ooze spores in some of those situations. Um, there was work done by Dr. Bud Platt uh, and his group quite a few years ago now, probably 20 years ago, which looked at survival of ooze spores in PEI under sort of artificial conditions. They, they generated the spores in the lab and then kind of put them under different environmental conditions to see if they would survive under temperatures and, and moisture levels typically found in PEI. And they did find survival under our conditions. So there's definitely a risk, especially in places like BC or Southern Ontario, where climate is typically less harsh than other parts of the country. And I think those two areas is where we sometimes see these, these recombinants um, you know, forming and where the highest risk of ooze spore overwintering would be. So it's definitely something we're going to keep a handle on. Thanks, uh, Rick. Our next question is once again from Ryan, and it's, will nightshade weeds host late light? Uh, another good question, Ryan. Thanks. And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, and controlling nightshade weeds is uh, certainly an important um, control measure if that's um, you know, a weed that's present in your area, certainly. Uh, that type of weed is, is common in several production areas and absolutely they can host um, the pathogen causing late blight. Thanks, Rick. And our next question is from Christian Lebeau Jacob and he asks, can you identify a late bite lesion other than biochemical methods, even when it's heavenly colonized by bacteria? For example, uh, by the way it looks, does it retain the rusty color? So if you were just dealing with, say, an infected leaf or, or, or something in the field and there's other, other stuff there, like the, the, um, the question kind of indicates, it can be challenging. But if you place that leaf in um, a little moist chamber, which you can do just by putting it in a plastic bag with some wet paper towel and keeping it in a cooler place almost like a garage somewhere where it's going to be around 15 degrees which is the optimal temperature for sporulation of this pathogen. Uh, in about 24 hours if you look at that leaf again and there's light blight there you should be able to see that white fuzz those lemon shaped spores. It's especially good if you have a, a really good magnifying glass uh, that you can then kind of peek at this sample and, and see whether you see those lemon shaped spores um, produced on the lesion. So you know, no molecular biology with that technique, but it can actually be pretty effective. A um, little more difficult on infected tuber to get that to happen. Um, usually it's, uh, you know, not as readily, um, the spores aren't as readily produced from the tuber tissue, but from a leaf tissue, it's usually not uh, uh, something that you can try. Thanks. And we have another question from Christian and it's, do you see a lot of phenotypic diversity in the morphology of the sporangia for the different genotypes or do they all look the same? That was a lot of words that I don't normally pronounce, so I'm sorry <laughs> if I pronounced them wrong. <laughs> no, that's a good question. So basically, um, do the spores look, uh, especially the sporangia, those lemon-shaped spores, do they look very different from one strain to another? And so far, we haven't seen that. Certainly different Phytophthora species, 
if you think of the one causing pink rot, Phytophthora receptica, or there's other Phytophthora causing diseases in other different crops, um, they do look quite different between species. But between strains of, a, of the infestan species so far, we really don't see any morphological differences in the spores. We do see differences in how they grow in culture. Um, some of the strains, like US 23, are much more difficult to grow in culture than some of the older strains. They don't like being outside the plant as much. Um, they like being on a living host. This pathogen tends to be one that, you know, um, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. It it can um, it likes to be in a living host, but at the same time, it is able to grow on some artificial media. But some of the strains like it more than others, and 23 is more difficult to grow in artificial media than some of the other strains. So we definitely see differences that way. Thanks. And we have a question from Hader Abbas. And the question is, what crops can be growing immediately after tomatoes or potatoes are lost to late blight? Yeah, so um, so far, we're not really dealing with those oospores that will survive in the soil to any extent. So we're really only worried about those lemon-shaped spores causing disease. And those are the ones that move around in the wind and rain from an infected uh, field to another. Um, so as long as you know the crop that you're dealing with um, was either free of disease or if it did have disease is killed down effectively um, before you grow uh, the next crop, there shouldn't be really any survival of those lemon-shaped spores from one crop to the next. They're actually pretty, you know, what's the right word? I guess pretty sensitive to desiccation. Um, I mentioned the moving on storm systems over many kilometers, but that's uh, really only situations where those storms have a lot of cloud and, and wet conditions so that the spores can make it. Once they're exposed to sunlight for any length of time or drier conditions, they die pretty quickly. So um, yeah, there's not usually much carryover in that way. Most of the carryover typically is on infected tubers, which uh, go into storage and uh, seed tubers are implanted next year, which could be infected. And you know that's the carryover from one year to the next uh, on this living tuber tissue. Super interesting. Our next question is from Tracy Shinners Kamali, and it's she asks, "Do you have any suggestions on fungicide strategies for seed treatment now that there are no longer any MZPSPTSs?" <laughs> yeah, and no, all thanks, Tracy. Tracy, great to hear from you. Um, so. As I mentioned, we really haven't found any resistance issues so far in any of the newer products with, with the strains, which is a great news story. Um, <clears throat> and as you mentioned, a lot of the older chemistries like the mancozebs and chlorothalonils and so on are starting to, to phase out. And um, you know they were typically the go-to backbones for a lot of not just seed treatments, but of course, foliar treatments too. Um, but as those start to, um, to, I guess, be phased out to some extent, then it's becoming more important with the newer products, which are often more targeted, to use resistance management strategies. So mix up the game, use different products, don't have the same program all the time, do some mixes where possible, and um, you know, use definitely a resistance management strategy moving forward uh, now that we're moving away from all these more broad spectrum products. So in terms of seed treatment, um, you know, those products that are now registered for seed treatment so far uh, are effective. We haven't seen anything to suggest otherwise. Thank you. And just a quick apologies on my side if I'm pronouncing anyone's names wrong. I am. Um, I'm a writer, not a reader, not a news presenter. <laughs> um, our next question comes from Matthew Visser, and he's asking, uh, "What are the most econom What's the most economical chemical for late blight prevention on potatoes?" Oh my goodness, uh, I'm not an economist, so a little bit outside my venue. There's probably people on this call that have uh, would be better to uh, able to answer that, like Ryan and Tracy. I'm not sure if they can <laughs> comment here, but uh, typically the older chemistries like the broad spectrums I mentioned have been also the most economical. Um, um, but as those phase out, of course, the uh, program is going to start to get more expensive. So. Um, I, I would say, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, you need a mixed approach, so not the same program from year to year for resistance management reasons. Um, but any of the products that are available in the toolbox are effective. We don't see any 
problems so far with resistance. So I think you can you can decide from season to season um, based on your business model what what you know what your costs will be, what products, uh, uh, how much they cost in a given year, and what might be effective for your program. So I don't think there's one answer to that. I think everyone's going to tailor make their program based on their own production area and their own their own business model. Thank you. And our next question is from Florian Deeker. And the question is, have you looked at the percentage of late flight in certified seed? In Europe, they concluded that up to 10% of certified seed has late flight in it. Wow, that's, um, that's a higher number than I would have expected. I wouldn't expect ours to be that high. Um, but the challenge here is because um, all you need is one infected plant per 10,000 seed pieces to generate an epidemic that the tolerance for infection is so low. Um, so that's the challenge. You, you can never really um, tease out a seed lot to be clean enough to, to give you risk-free situation. And that's why seed treatments are gonna be important moving forward um, to help with managing the seed situation, uh, disease on the seed. Um, I don't have a number for what our, you know, disease levels would be in seed in Canada. I wouldn't expect them to be that high for sure. I would think more around 1% would be reasonable, but uh, even so, uh, the tolerance is really um, zero, which is impossible to get to, which is why seed treatments are, are important. Um, this isn't a quarantinable disease, something like potato wart would be. So, you know, it readily moves around, as I mentioned, on, on storm systems, on seed, on tomato transplants. Uh, and, you know, that movement is going to continue moving forward. So it's important to manage the disease right from the get-go with uh, as clean a seed as you can get. Uh, and then using a seed treatment would also be beneficial. And then, of course, managing the disease during the season uh, and then getting into storage. So it's really a, a full season-long effort. Uh, that's going to be important to manage late flight. Thank you. And we have another question from Hater up next. Um, can late flight be suppressed in greenhouses and high tunnels by man maintaining high temperatures? So that's an interesting question. And that's why we're looking at some of the environmental aspects of uh, how these chains um, differ. And as I showed you there, it looks like US-23 can survive a little bit warmer conditions than US-8 did. And, um, you know, that's still preliminary information. So in the next few years, we're hoping to get a lot more information about how temperature um, affects some of these new strains. Um, typically, you know, there's that sweet spot around 15 to 18 degrees that um, most late flight strains love. And once you get too much above or below that, uh, you know, the, the efficacy uh, or survival really drops off or reproduction. But that is something that's different between strains and we really need uh, a little more information on that uh, to really answer that question. So I, I would say, I guess, stay tuned. Thank you. And we have another question from Hader and he's asking, could potatoes become affected by late flight after they are harvested? Right. So <clears throat> when you harvest um, the potatoes, uh, you know, most of the infection takes place, as I mentioned, with spores trickling down through the soil profile and infecting the tubers. But sometimes those infections, when they happen, you know, fairly close to harvest time, are invisible. So you don't see the infection on the tubers going into storage. And then that rot develops in storage, um, you know, slowly, obviously, but it certainly will develop under those uh, cooler conditions. And then bacteria and other organisms come in to give you uh, more serious problems as the the pile starts to um, to rot. So yeah, you can definitely get situations where the uh, infection isn't visible going into storage, but then develops later. Thank you. And we have a question from Oleg Ter Tarasenko now. And the question is, how to, do you protect potatoes from a thranoknose in the second half of the growing season? And sorry for not pronouncing that word right. <laughs> um... I think that was probably, sorry, anthracnose, is that? Yes, that's the word. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's uh, colitotrichum, I think he's talking about there. And um, we typically think of that uh, causing black dot in potato. And, um, you know, that's a disease that hasn't got enough attention, really, from a research perspective, as it, it should have. 
Um, there's actually a presentation on that issue in the recent um, BC Growers meeting in January, which I think is still available on their website, um, looking at different opportunities to manage um, black dot and potato. So far, a lot of the effort has been looking at products like Quadra supplied early on and uh, you know early in the sort of plant development phase to try to get reduction in disease later in the year. Typically, you don't see black dot until much later in the growing season, especially on the base of the stems, but the management has to start quite early to get any reduction in that. But to be honest, so far, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in their management of black dot. It's one that is part of this whole early dying complex with vertisu and other, and other pathogens, but it's one that we really don't have enough management options yet. It's um, it's one that requires more attention for sure. Thanks so much, Rick. I think that's all of our questions. And thank you guys, everyone, for asking those great questions. They were all so interesting. Um, so first off, I would just love to thank our speaker, Rick, for joining us. And once again, I would like to thank our partner, the Canadian Potato Council, for making this webinar possible. And of course, a big thank you goes out to everyone for participating. I hope you have found this information valuable. Again, a recording of this webinar will be made available on spudsmart.com shortly after the end of this webinar. And thanks again, and we hope you all have a wonderful day.